All right, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Steve Peters, so let's get started here. Um, so in kind of this whole issue about scaling up, I think the first thing <clears throat> we have to ask ourselves is, are we scaling up appropriately, whether it's downsizing, staying the same, or getting bigger, or having the capability to do all of those things? And uh, I mean, you can see the the picture on the left, uh, you know, kind of rather, you know, the traditional small scale operation, the investment, you're probably looking at uh, less than $100 there, $50 to clean seed the old fashioned way. On the right, uh, that Oliver gravity table, which basically does a similar thing to the to the fans in terms of it's a gravity separation. And that unit, I'm not exactly sure, but you could probably pay anywhere from 20 to 50 or more thousand dollars for a unit like that. Uh, so you really got to make sure before you uh, you know think about investing in a piece of equipment like that 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 it's really suitable for you. I, you know, I kind of broke it into the kind of the generally speaking, the small scale would be the, you know, with minimal equipment, uh, limited labor requirements, and really best for uh, breeding, stock seed, and specialty crops, uh, including, you know, all the biodiverse crops that we're interested in. Whereas the large scale at the other end of the spectrum, it's going to be more limited to a few very popular varieties or uh, commodity items. So there's this is a smaller, definitely a smaller segment in here. Um, and then I think before we you know go further with it, you've got to really you know get real about what your what your goals really are. And I think of course all of us are saving seeds for ourselves, uh, but. Uh, I think we're going to we're going to focus on production seed here, production seed that you're going to turn around and sell to uh, farmers and seed companies. Uh, but there's also specialized seed production, uh, foundation and stock seed, and uh, this is this is a nice little niche that uh, really, in most cases, probably doesn't require too much scaling up. And uh, you know, this is your high dollar seed that's low volume. And so growers that have uh, the ability to really pay attention, really have attention to detail and um, are, you know, very focused in that way, this, this could be a definite uh, area for them to go. Um, but does scaling up really make sense? And I think, you know, this is kind of a list of basic questions you have to ask yourself. Uh, first of all, you know, do we have an economic opportunity? I mean, is there is there really a demand out there? Um, is it actually going to benefit your farm in terms of its uh, revenue stream? Uh, because you could be spending a lot of money and uh, to to maybe just get a little, and it may not be worth it. May not be worth the investment. Uh, and is it more efficient than your small scale? Um, you know, is it is it uh, you know, looks good on your bottom line, and does it fit your whole operation? And I think a lot of the growers I'm working with are produce growers that are considering getting into seed. So if you do have a produce operation, you've really got to make sure everything integrates well with the with the produce. That you have the labor at the right time, and that uh, when it's time to harvest, you really can get right on it and deal with it. And that you have it works in terms of your crop rotation and also your watering, uh, your watering uh, schemes as well. And uh, and then it's you know what actually does need scaling up? Is it just a matter of getting more labor, uh, you know, a fancy piece of equipment, or maybe perhaps you could be sharing equipment with other people? Maybe you don't really need to scale up, but but you can organize yourself with other growers that you can share like a central facility that has you know some of the seed cleaning and uh, the harvesting and cleaning uh, that's held communally. So um, and then I'll just you know again I just you know to reiterate here what is the demand and then is that demand sustainable you know is it a crop that's that's actually 
uh, out there and you know it's going to be out there for a long time or is it just a flash in the pan um, and and as I said before you have the resources labor and, and management time and expertise is uh, definitely something you don't want to undervalue uh, because you get to a big scale and you can start to, the crops can start to get away from you and you can start you're trying to cut corners and then you lose quality like you're not really doing the selection that you really need to be doing to maintain the quality of that variety and then do you have the storage capacity you know it's if you are growing large amounts uh, and especially if you're talking about large seeded crops that require forklifts to move things around uh, you know you've got to make sure you've got a place for them uh, so you know and I recommend for people when they're look considering scaling up really uh, develop as best as you can a strategic plan five years or more if you can you know put the pencil to the paper and so identifying trends uh, of wholesale and retail produce buyers. So this is uh, you know, really good to get in touch with uh, the produce, the people that are actually buying this produce, that are buying the produce from the seed. And so it's uh, part of it is when you're growing, especially with new varieties, you want to be able to uh, encourage, you want to get people out there to know that your variety exists. So like, you maybe you have this great pepper you want to grow the seed for but no one really even knows what the, the fresh product is so you want to somehow get that you want to grow that crop get it out to the wholesalers and retailers and get them get their customers to uh, experience it uh, and then you know I think it's really really important to be start experimenting at a small scale and I'm going to talk about that a little bit next but uh, you know just start small and uh, work your way up so uh, and then especially just be very adaptable and flexible and if uh, you know before you lock yourself into a, le a large financial investment uh, you you know you want to be able and, and if in fact you do eventually say invest in a large piece of equipment and maybe you don't maybe you're not able to use that piece of equipment Perhaps, you know, then you need to consider maybe selling it to somebody else or maybe sharing it with others. Um, okay, I'm going to um, talk here a couple of slides about a couple of crops I've worked with recently uh, at sort of what I call an experimental unit size, you know, 1,500 square feet, which is uh, roughly, you know, it's a five foot wide bed, 300 feet long. And I like that unit size simply because it's large enough that you can really see what the crop is going to do. You have enough plants, you can understand the crop, but small enough that you can do it pretty much with low tech hand equipment. And if you get a crop failure, it's not going to bankrupt the farm. Uh, so, you know, this is broccoli that I grew uh, in uh, Pescadero, California. And this is just an initial harvest. And then um, what you want to do when you're, when you're growing these crops is you really want to document what it actually, what did it take to produce that crop? And this, these are actually real numbers. You know, maybe I didn't, I didn't put all the hours I spent thinking about this. <laughs> you know, then you got about quadruple it, but, um, and this may be, and you may want to even double this at the end, because I know people say, well, you always underestimate your labor. But, you know, in this case, these are the, the basic, you know, the basic activities to take it all the way through. So I got basically on this, I had about 40 hours. And uh, this was me, me, myself, and I on this. And um, so, and then, okay, then a, another crop I grew also in Pescadero. This is a a beet crop these are, we were just harvesting here and in this case these growers I'll, I'll tell you this beet uh, it was a cylindrical beet called Ferrono and they couldn't find it in the catalogs it, it had disappeared and so I said well you can grow your own and they didn't know they could and, but they did and they so they selected roots and put them in the ground along a, 
a hedge of, of fruit trees to the left. I, I didn't really want it like this. I wanted a block, but this was the only space they had. And it, it ended up being about 1,300 square feet. So just about kind of that experimental unit size. And I had about 75 plants here. Okay, on the beach, same thing. I, I monitored, you know, how many hours I had. A little bit of time was spent in the storing, the trim, selecting trimming and storing routes, planning the second year. And then, then there was a, I, I, I divided it into harvesting and rough cleaning and then final cleaning. Okay, so um, then I actually looked at, after the yields, after, and I, if you look at this chart, the tender early green broccoli and the Ferrono beet, those were the two crops that I grew. The snap bean was kind of a generic snap bean. I just used, I just used that as, a, as sort of a comparison with these. And this is the yields for the snap bean I based on low yield estimates from Knott's Vegetable Handbook to kind of get you an idea of, well, how much would a roughly 1,500 square feet produce? And there's my labor cost for the three, assuming $15 an hour. And again, you, you know, you could $10, $20, I mean, whatever. You can plug your own numbers in there. But this is just for the sake of the exercise. And you can see what kinds of gross wholesale revenue versus the labor cost. And, you know, broccoli looked pretty favorable here. I happen to have a very high yield on that. Uh, and the beet had a very high yield. Um, but what's interesting is then I... I I tried to calculate roughly how many acres that 1,500 square feet of seed could plant. And the broccoli is like a phenomenal number. I mean, I was shocked, but if you actually go and transplant out, uh, it was 30 pounds of broccoli seed. If you transplant that out, you could get as, that could plant as much as 240 acres. So actually with that crop, I'm, all, I'm, in, this, I'm in the game now. I've actually... I've got enough seed that I could sell to quite a few people. Whereas at the other end of the spectrum, the snap bean obviously is not a crop I'm going to be doing by hand and growing 1,500 square feet. And in fact, the labor was almost as much as the gross revenue. And by the way, these wholesale revenues were based on sort of average wholesale costs. So, um, so something like snap beans, if I really wanted to get into that, I've got to be looking at a whole different scale. Whereas the broccoli, I, I think I could probably stay at this level until maybe I could sell, maybe I had a demand to plant a thousand acres or two thousand acres. But that's only one variety of broccoli. And, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of, bro you know, there's lots of varieties out there. So, so then I'm probably good to go with that. The beets is sort of somewhere in between. Um, to the market. Yeah, what the question was. When I said a thousand acres, I mean what I'm talking about is what's the demand from the fresh produce growers to uh, for 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 that seed, and uh, so you could very easily uh, lettuce is another crop like broccoli. You could very easily overproduce, you know, even at the hand level. So you've really got to get an idea of what your your true market is, and um, and then I'm I just want to finish here with uh, you know, word about seed contracts. So I think, um, and really, you know, reading the fine print and understanding what you're getting into here, because I think if you're scaling up, when you're scaling up, uh, the important thing is that you want to have some assurance that you're going to be able to continue to have a market and continue to be able to sell your product and not be stuck with a huge inventory. So, and, and having a contract is nice if you understand it. I mean, it's at least good for that one year. But, I mean, if you have a good relationship with the seed buyer or the seed company or who's ever buying it, uh, then you, you can at least rest, assured, you know, rest a little easier that you are going to be able to come back next year, especially if you do a good job. And, uh, and you want to make sure you have uh, like a contingency clause in there. Like say if you have a total crop failure, what happens then? Does the seed company reimburse you at all? Or do they pay for any of the expenses? Or if you have an overage, what's the what's the the agreement in terms of if you have twice the amount of seed produced that that uh, you originally contracted for? And and then you've got to consider all your seed cleaning costs, 
what the seed quality requirements are, because that could be pretty onerous. And then I know up here in Oregon and Washington, black leg is a huge issue, for example. So you've really got to know what, what's going to happen if you have a big crop and, and suddenly you've got seed-borne diseases on it. And then, um, and then payment terms, of course, you know, is it spread out over time? Do they pay you some up front? And then what are the, what kind of support do you actually get from the seed company? Are they providing you with agronomic information, uh, growing inf you know, growing information? Are they providing you with the stock seed? And um, do they have any information from previous field trials? And, and do they have any tips about how to grow it? And then, and then does, will the seed company come and visit you and have, a, have consultations with you? So I think all of those things are really important when you are, uh, you know, you are considering this because, you know, it's a big investment and uh, you want to, you know, you definitely uh, don't want to get stung too badly because it's, you know, it's hard enough. You know, we all know it's it's hard enough for for growers, um, but again, I'll say take a conservative approach. You know, to uh, when you you are thinking about expanding. I think uh, I think about my my time's up, but thanks.